everyone, Jennifer here. I'm just popping into the very beginning again to ask you to please rate and review this show on any podcast platform that allows it, especially Apple Podcasts, because that really helps the show find new listeners. Okay, here we go. That was the beginning of our journey. He, he was there for the whole week, struggling to breathe and having chest pain. And I kept asking if I could come down. The, the rules were still fluctuating a lot at that time with the hospital. So one person said, you might be able to see him. And then when I finally would ask the right person, they said, no, we're not allowing anybody in. It, that whole floor has become a COVID floor. There was the last normal day, the last day that things were the way they were before they weren't anymore. We kind of all rushed out of the house and said a quick goodbye. And, you know, little did I know that would be the last time I hugged my mom. He yells and tells me, he's getting ready to go. He said, I'm okay, just stay here. I'll be home in a few hours. We tell him bye and he leaves. And that was the last time we ever saw him. It's like the minute that helicopter hit the air, it just hit me. What I was watching, because I knew he wasn't coming home and he knew he wasn't coming home. For me, I took it more more personally because I'm a nurse practitioner and why can't I save him? I can help all these other people and why can't I save him? They're telling us that it was time, we needed to make a decision, we need to go ahead and just take him off the ventilator. And I was like, how do we know? One thing I like to tell people is that if you lose somebody to COVID, you need to talk about the person you lost will outlast other people's desire to hear about it. We make sure that our family members and loved ones' memories lived on. That's really important to me is that people don't forget. I don't want to forget any of it. So talk about them. Talk about them till people are sick of hearing about them. Because as long as, as long as you're still talking about them, they're never far away. And the last thing that my mom said is, she said, when you get to heaven, we will look for each other. Hello everyone, you're listening to For Those We Lost. I'm your host, Jennifer Sullivan. Thank you for being here. If you've lost a loved one to COVID and would like to share your story on the show, please send me an email. My email address is forthoseweLostPodcast at gmail.com or go to the website forthoseweLostPodcast.com and click on the contact button and you can reach me that way as well. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com forward slash for those we lost. The link is in the show notes. All right, let's get started with this episode. Today, I'll be talking to Michelle in California. Michelle lost her husband, Thor, on September 2nd, 2021. Thor was very proud of his Norwegian heritage, and they both loved Marvel movies. Michelle describes him as the strongest and silliest person she knew. For context, we recorded this episode on June 29th, 2022. Michelle talks about how she and Thor met, which is such a beautiful story. And she also mentions the Facebook Widows Group and the Soaring Spirits Widows Group. Those links are also in the show notes below. And with that, I'd like to welcome Michelle to the show. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you for having me. You live in California. Yes. And today we're talking about your husband, Thor, who passed away on September 2nd, 2021. Yes, correct. So you're in that first year. It's been about nine months for you. Yeah, we'll be coming up on uh, 10 months, a few days. Yeah. So what I usually do is start in March of 2020. And I want to start there just briefly for you to just like, how did you hear about COVID and how did your life change you and your husband? Um, Well, at the time I was, I work in emergency medical service. So it was definitely at the forefront of everything that we were doing. It was talked about every day at work. We have the news on every day at work. Um, And he works dealing with the public. So it was definitely talked about. They had some closures for a little while. And then they were um, back up and running. And so it was, uh, it became a lot because we were testing every day at work. Before we came into work, you had to take a COVID test. And everybody was, um, I think by then, wearing masks. I know for us, we had a big trip to Norway planned the end of March. We were already um, starting to pack because my husband Thor is very proud of his Norwegian heritage and he really wanted to go see the Vikings and and enjoy that and so we were really looking forward to that trip and a week before we were supposed to leave they shut down air travel completely so that that was a big that was a big deal for us we were very disappointed and then and then everything started getting really bad and and you kind of realize wow we're just in the beginning of it yeah so I, I, since you mentioned Norway and your husband's name is Thor, can you tell uh, me how you met and the significance of that and everything? Well, um, my husband and I both met when we were in our early 40s. Um, both of us had, we, neither of us had been married and neither of us had children. And we had both been on an online dating website called plentyoffish.com. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we linked up right away and, you know, his name at the time was just Big T. I didn't know what his name was until we actually started talking and then realized it was Thor, which was right in the heyday of the Marvel movies. So it was pretty popular. We, we have, I've got hammer stuff galore in my house, all kinds of things that have Thor memorabilia. And so he was always very proud of it. Uh, his dad was very proud and wanted a strong son, strong son's name. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so then we had started dating, and um, that was we met March second, two thousand thirteen, and um, we were we were married November fourth of two thousand seventeen, and um, and then he passed away September second of twenty twenty one. So we had eight and a half years together. Not enough time. Definitely not enough time. So if you can uh, just start in the summer of 2021 and talk about what happened and how COVID came into your lives. So we were definitely both working a lot. Um, You know, he was pretty much, you know, dealt with the public and I was at at my job as well. And um, our last normal day together, we had, you know, we went out and ran some errands. We had, you know, went to an outdoor mall and we had normally one day off a week. So we didn't get to see each other very often besides a hello and goodbye. Um, We went swimming in our condo pool. That was one of our favorite things to do. And then the next day he started to feel sick and, you know, had all the symptoms. And, you know, we talked to the the regular doctor over a Zoom call uh, about a day or two later. and, And he finally got tested on Friday, which would have been August 6th, got the results Saturday, August 7th, and he was really, really struggling by then, but he was who he was. He's like, I'm fine. I'll get through it, Um, and then I I went to work on Sunday, and when I came home Monday morning, he was the worst I'd ever seen him, and was, you know, had a Again, all the symptoms, the chills, vomiting, diarrhea, everything. So he finally is like, we need to go to the hospital. So Monday would have been August 9th. I drove him to our ER. It was a big hospital. I didn't want to take him to one of the smaller ones for this. 
and had to take them outside to like a, a staging area where they weren't letting people directly into the ER at that time. And they had a big tent set up and I had to wait around the corner. I couldn't be near him. They, you know, gave him the little nasal cannula to help him breathe and probably had him outside for a good two hours before they finally had a room in the ER available. And I, you know, said goodbye. Didn't sing for one second. That would be the last time I saw him physically. Um, and then they took him in there and, and we text and Zoomed and talked. I went back that night assuming I would be able to see him, um, but they didn't quite have a room for him. They didn't get him an actual room in the hospital until about 7 p.m. So the next day I went back down there assuming they would let me in and now that he had a room, but they wouldn't, but they let me send up a few things, personal items and, and some stuff that he needed. And that was the beginning of our journey. He, he was there for the whole week struggling to breathe and having chest pain. And I kept asking if I could come down. The, the rules were still fluctuating a lot at that time with the hospital. So one person said, you might be able to see him. And then when I finally would ask the right person, they said, no, we're not allowing anybody in. It, that whole floor has become a COVID floor. And I had tested negative. I, I never had COVID, um, but they wouldn't allow me to come up there for any reason, even if I begged to gown up, put every mask on they have, they, they were not allowing it. And then by that next Saturday night, um, I talked to him just a little bit. We had FaceTimed a few times and he didn't respond back to me a little bit later in the day. I didn't think much of it because I knew he was struggling to breathe and he was really tired. And um, overnight I had, I had turned my phone off, which I will regret forever but the doctor had called at like three in the morning and just left me a really vague message. And then I called back the next morning and like at seven and nobody would return my phone call till three hours later. And they finally told me that he had such trouble breathing that they had to put him on the bed. And, and, and then they let me come down that afternoon and I could look at him through the hallway. Um, I could just, you know, see him. He was unconscious, pretty much remained that way for the next three weeks. Um, and and they were optimistic. I, I, you know, I had everybody interacting with me, telling me what kind of medication he should be on, what he shouldn't be on, what I should have done, what I what I should do. And, and everybody had their opinion of of what to do, and that was a struggle, especially because. Um, his mom and his sister are both in upstate New York. So they're only going through me, you know, making sure what I'm doing, what they've heard, what their friends have told them. So it was a lot of information to process. And I, I've always considered myself a good patient. I have my own medical issues. So I listened to the doctors and uh, I don't know if I did the right thing on that or not, but I journaled every day what every doctor and what every nurse told me. I have a booklet of everything that happened just because I knew I was going to have to relay it to at least at least his mom and his sister, if not 10 more people after that. Um, yeah. And then um, uh, that following Saturday, so he, he was on the vent for a week and then they said he's, he's getting worse. He's not improving and we think we need to put him on ECMO. I didn't know what that was, but I know a lot about it now. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So I knew they had said he needs help with his heart and his lungs. So they were going to circulate out his blood and reoxygenate it and, and detoxify it and then circulate it back in to give his body a break and help. So I thought, okay, that's, it sounds awful, but if that's what we need to do, then that's what we need to do. And then the hospital said, oh, but we don't have any staff to run it. So we need to find another hospital to send them to. Oh. So that was horrifying. And I even got my sister-in-law involved, who is a, a nurse high up at her hospital about six hours away. And she actually had her whole, her whole COVID floor that she was in charge of. So she, she helped me tremendously explaining things. She even talked to the doctor and knew more than he did, which scared the crap out of me. So um, thank you, Katrina. And um, 
but um, so we finally got him transferred to another hospital nearby and they were able to get him on ECMO the, the next day. So there was a, a, about a day and a half delay of figuring out where to send him. And so he was there almost a good, a, a week and a half. And again, checked every day, what, what are they doing? What are they giving him? How's he doing? And it was a constant up and down. The, the, nurse was, the nurses would say he's stable. Here are his numbers, which weren't improving, but they still sounded what I thought optimistic. And then I would get a phone call from a doctor that would be all doom and gloom. And he's the worst patient we've ever seen. And then I would just be a constant roller coaster of emotions, not knowing what to do, what to think, what else can I do? And, you know, I, I had friends tell me, well, make sure you tell him to play music because that'll keep him motivated. So I asked the doc, the nurse every day, can you, do you have any heavy metal rock? He really <laughs> likes to work out to that. That'll pump him up. But they're like, um, we don't have that. We can play country. I'm like, okay, just play country music. <laughs> but I was trying to do what anybody said that would might be better. And, mm -hmm. and I asked repeatedly if I can come to visit and they would not allow it. And then finally, it was getting a little bit closer and the doctor had, had I talked to him that morning and I said, please, I'm begging you, can I please come? And see him and, and he said you know we think I think we might be able to allow that and I was ecstatic but then I thought later oh crap most of the time what I've heard they only allow people to come in once it's end of life and that yeah. really scared me the only other thing that happened is the last three days before that the nurses let me zoom with him so even though he's unconscious um, they would put a phone next to his ear and they let me talk to him for about 15 minutes for the last three nights, which was, I think, therapeutic for me because I could say a lot. I had messages from his mom and his sister um, and, uh, and other friends that wanted me to tell him something. So that was helpful. And then the last, that last day, that same day, um, it was a Thursday, the second, and um, about eight o'clock, I got a call from the doctor saying he is not doing well and he won't survive the night unless we do an emergency procedure because the, the tubes or something from the ECMO machine were, were clotting or clogging or breaking down and they needed to replace them. And if, if they didn't do it, he would not make the night. And if they did do it, he was a very high chance he wouldn't survive it anyway. Um, because they have to release everything, which means he'll stop breathing. And they said it only takes 30 to 45 seconds to put everything back in again, but that's mm -hmm. critical. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, of course, you have to do it. You have to do it. And um, they called me back two hours later and told me that he had died. And um, he had stopped breathing and they did CPR and they did everything they could to try and bring him back and they couldn't. So they had named off a couple of the things that had happened, you know, like bleeding or, or um, other, other things. I don't remember everything exactly, but I do have it all written down in some really sporadic notes. And so they let me come down that evening. Of course, I had to call his mom first and wake her up and tell her, and then I had to call his sister and tell her as well. And luckily my dad had been staying with me for like the last three weeks. He'd come down and, and stayed with me the whole time, which was wonderful. Thank you, dad. So he drove me to the hospital and I was allowed to, to see him. Um, I had to completely gown up, booties, gloves, everything. I wasn't allowed to touch him. Um, they had him all, him all tucked in. Um, luckily, he had taken all the all this machinery out, all the tubes. He looked, he actually looked really good. He looked like he could have just woken up. Um, but they let me see him for about 30 minutes. The first half is all just crying uncontrollably. But luckily, I was able to get myself together and, and talk to him. Um, tell him I know he's not there anymore in that body and know that he's with me always. 
he will be with me always in my heart. And then my dad took me home and went to bed. And then the next day I started making all the phone calls. Luckily, I have a twin sister and she was there with me the next morning too. And she helped me make phone calls and, and let people know. And, and we just, you know, hung out for a couple of days, just the three of us really. Um, and we planned his service. It was two weeks later. I had him cremated. Um, but we had a really, really nice service. We had a whole bunch of people show up. His mom and his sister flew out. And he had two, two of his grade school friends from back um, in New York came out as well. That was really special. And then I had kept his ashes with me. Um, and he, he would have turned 50 on May 13th. So we took him up to June Lake with my dad and some of my family that had went on this little annual fishing trip that my husband got invited to <laughs> the last few years. So he really loved it up there in June Lake, which is just outside of Mammoth. Um, and so we spread his ashes up there. And it was, it was perfect. I was hoping it would be a good experience and it was fantastic. So I'm really happy to have that. So <clears throat> that's about it. That, that's, that's my story for now. <laughs> I, I have a couple of questions. The, so you were, you went to see him one other time, but you had to stand outside in the hallway. Yes. And was that at the first hospital or yes. the, okay. I, I guess in a way, I'm just wondering like if and I'm, it makes me emotional if they let you do that. Was there a specific reason that they let you do that versus just you know, coming in a little more often and being able to be with him. You know, yeah, I, I don't know. And I don't know if it was just that one doctor mm -hmm. that was sympathetic since we had just vented him. Uh, and, and I mean, I, I was just like, please let me just touch him. I just want to like rub his, his back or something yeah, or, or talk to him in his ear or something. But yeah, it does. That I think was one of the cruelest things is not being able to be with him. And, you know, I've joined two Facebook pages specifically for COVID widows, which has been tremendously helpful. And when you hear people across the nation have very similar and very different experiences, but some of them were allowed to sit by their bedside for weeks and that that makes me angry. Yeah. That was another question that I had was how you feel knowing that other states had very different rules about that than California. Cause I live on the West coast. I live in Oregon and I know Oregon, Washington, and California along with New York uh, had very, very strict rules. Right. Yeah. I, I just think it was cruel. Mm -hmm. it's just, it is the cruelest thing ever. And I, I would have done anything they asked me to do to be allowed in his room with him. Yeah. Yeah, that physical touch, hearing your voice, all of those things, they help so much. Right. Right. So we've talked about it being less than a year. And one of the things I, I ask people is what you are doing for yourself to take care of yourself as you come up on all of these events like um, August, you know, 9th when he went to the hospital and before when he tested positive. Are, are you, I guess, worried about them or thinking about them or gearing up in an emotional way to relive those experiences a year later? Um, well, I don't know that because me personally, um, spreading his ashes was what I consider more of a memorial to him. So to be honest, I haven't even thought what I will do on the date. Mm -hmm. Luckily for me, I, I was already seeing a therapist. Um, so thankfully, she was already lined up and, you know, taking the whole burden herself. The good thing about her, she was, she is wonderful. 
but she had also seen my, my husband a, a few times, a few years back. So she knew him directly and that helped immensely because I would just, she knew our relationship and everything and how we had met and just that he loved me. Well, obviously. So being able to talk with her um, in the beginning, it was every week. Now it's, I'm cut back to, to three weeks now, but having a, her there on a steady basis and journaling a lot so that I could talk to her about things that would come up throughout the week or, or emotions. And one of my girlfriends had lost her son a few months before I lost Thor. And she sent me a book that was um, very helpful. It was just a, a daily like meditation that had like three little segments and you could find something relatable in one of the segments. It's a little bit religious. Some of it's not, so I could take from it what I chose, but it was very helpful to have something at the end of the night, clear my head and put some thought into what I'm feeling. Yeah. I talk to my husband every night. I have a, a, a really great photo of him that he took on our first anniversary. And he took a selfie because he's a goofball. <laughs> and it's the most beautiful picture of him looking up, smiling. So we use that at the service and I've kept it in my house. So I talk to him every night before I go to bed. Obviously in the beginning, it was a lot of tears, a lot of emotion, you know, anger, resentment, you know, sadness. But as the months have gone on, it's luckily progressed. So more happiness. So I tell him something silly that I did that day or, or, you know, something that happened that would make him smile. Yeah. So I do, luckily, I feel healing is there. And um, I feel like it, it, I've gotten stronger because of it. Um, and like I said, the, the COVID pages are really, really helpful. It, on one of those pages is where I heard about your podcast. And I also heard about um, a widow like convention. It, it's called Soaring Spirits. Mm -hmm. And they do a, a camp widow uh, nationwide, but it's only, I guess, hosted in a few different places each year. And it was going to be close to me in the middle of July. So I looked into it and I thought, you know what, now is the best time for me to go for more help. You know, they have classes they put together and, and they, all kinds of things that you can choose to be a part of or choose not to be a part of. So I'm going to be doing that in two weeks. And I, I'm a little scared, but I, I think I'm more looking forward to it and meeting. It, it, it's not just for COVID. It's for any widow or widower to go and, and become, uh, you know, part of these teaching lessons and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that will be very, very helpful. Yeah, well, that's good. So yeah. I feel like, I, I feel like what I'm hearing is that the spreading his ashes and being able to have a memorial service or funeral for him and his family come out and his friends was extremely healing for you. Absolutely. That's something, as you know, being on the forum boards that a lot of people uh, did not get. And then also there's, a, there's so many people even now who have not had any kind of memorial or funeral for their family member. Right, right. And, and I think mine just came down to the timing. At, yeah. at the time, they had started to loosen some of their restrictions. And uh, I, I think I checked out two or three different places and, and they did not have any restrictions. So uh, I was very fortunate for that. Yeah. I definitely don't take that one for granted. Yeah, we waited almost a year to have my mom's. We actually had it scheduled for November of 2020, thinking, <laughs> I laugh about it a little bit, thinking that everything was going to be over by then. Exactly. And, uh, and the restrictions tightened actually before Thanksgiving. And so we put it off until July of 2021. 
And I was, I was, I was distraught for the whole year. And I had somebody tell me having that memorial should help. It should help with healing and closure. And even though we had it outside, because there were still restrictions here in Oregon, and there were kids playing in a playground kind of nearby, I just, I got this sense that my mom would have loved it. And my aunt told me that too. She goes, your mom would have loved this. And that, that really helped. Yes. I really did come away from that feeling like I had, you know, a hundred pounds taken off my shoulders of grief and it felt very pivotal. Yeah. And, and you know, during the memorial service, I, I guess I called it a celebration of life. You know, Thor always told me really great stories of him being a kid with his friends and to have those um, have those friends there telling those stories that he loved and um the whole the whole room was cracking up with these really great embarrassing stories and I'm like oh my gosh he would have loved this so that, that was was a really good experience yeah considering everything you know yeah gosh he sounds like he was an incredibly funny vibrant person yeah, you know, he was, he was just a big, strong guy. He had like shoulders, like a linebacker. Um, he was also one of the, the silliest, funniest people I've ever met. He always, you know, he could always make me laugh, but he always made me feel safe. He was just, he was just one of a kind. Yeah. Is there one, one thing you miss about him? Um, more than any other or what are the things that you miss about him I, I would have to say his silliness they're just little tiny things like the way he said a certain word that would always make me laugh you know uh, he's uh from New York and um, when he would say a couple words they'd come out silly sounding to me being from California like we made a joke about I'm like oh look at the cat down there by the pool it's got it's got and he'd say it's got white paws and I'm like what did you say <laughs> so now anybody says pause I have to say it like he does you mean pause you know <laughs> and um he was just goofy in so many ways and it just I have a very stressful job so I really um embraced the laughter and so to find somebody who wanted to laugh as much as I did was really awesome. And you told me uh, when we spoke earlier that when you met on, when you saw his profile on the dating app, and I kind of want you to tell the story, it was the middle of the night. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead and tell. I think it's just, I think it's just precious. Uh, yeah, because I work um, graveyard shift. So uh, you know, when, when it was a little bit quieter, um, I went online and kind of looked at it for the first time and I saw his picture and saw what he was about. And I'm like, oh, I, I want to like, um, whatever you do to that page, like it or, or whatever. And I'm like, what, it's two in the morning. If I say I'm, I like this person at two in the morning, they're going to think weird of me or well, I'm like some weird stalker in the middle of the night. And I, I had shut it down and I, I was doing something else and I came back just to check on it like two hours later and he had liked my profile. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And it turns out he was also working late night and not getting home till like three in the morning. So he had gotten online and saw my profile and I was like, oh, interesting. And he was the first person that I talked to and the only person I dated from there. So, and, and we had joked and it was in our, I think we put it in our wedding vows, but people said, well, how did you meet? And we were both embarrassed to say that we met on a, a dating website. So since it was called plentyoffish.com, we just said, oh, we met fishing. <laughs> people were like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but my, my other thing I do remember from our wedding vows is he was a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan and a huge um, New York Yankee fan. And in the wedding vows that I wrote, I, I had said, you know, I would be his biggest fan but I would also be a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles and the Yankees. And that two, three months later, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl, which was one of the best days of his life. 
<laughs> I always remember that. That was a great day. Yeah. So you mentioned your sister and and I, you know, I, I'm sitting here thinking like a lot of the time family members who uh, go through loss, especially COVID loss, they grieve either together and support each other, or they grieve very differently and feel sort of separated. And so do you have family support with your grief? I have a huge support team. I'm very, very fortunate in that um I had said I have a, a twin sister so she's she's been with me all the time um my dad is phenomenal um my stepmom um I talked to both Thor's mom and sister um uh, regularly we text you know during the week and we talk on the phone so they're still completely supportive of me and my work friends my regular friends, I still have people that are checking on me. And it's, you know, like I said, almost a year out. Um, so uh, I feel for those people who don't have the support they need because it's been monumental to me yeah. to have that love coming from all angles. Yeah. So one of the last questions that I ask everybody who's on the show is what do you say to people who tell you that COVID isn't real? You know, and I, that's a that's a tough question because they have to be people that have not been affected by it. Anybody who's lost somebody from COVID, it's just, how, how can you say it's not real? I mean, to me, that's just ignorant. That's somebody wanting to make a, a political statement and be on one side of the line. And, and it's just, it's heartbreaking to hear that. Yeah, I read an article, and I think it came out a couple months ago, that it said something about the number of people that have died of COVID, which at the time, we were just over a million, yeah. and that a million people is less than 1%, I believe, of all the people in the United States. And so when you count their family members and extended family, there's only like three to 5% of people in the United States who have lost somebody to COVID, okay. which I feel like I'm, I'm a, I like to, I like to quantify things and try to figure things out. And I, I feel like people who say COVID isn't real or they don't really think it's that bad. I've heard a lot of people say that. Oh, I got it. It was just like the flu. It wasn't so bad. Right. Oh, right. and I'm like, you know, I, I learned in a COVID support group uh, about saying, ouch, <laughs> when somebody says something that hurts your feelings. And so I, I said to one person, I was like, ouch, my mom died of COVID because it, it is that bad. It's right. the, and, and it's random. I think perfectly healthy people who have no pre-existing conditions get COVID and die from COVID. Right. And you just can't tell how it's going to be or how your body's going to react to it and what's going to happen. And yeah, I just, I, I guess I hope as time goes on, and we continue to live with COVID as something in our lives that people will be more kind yeah. and find a way to just be more understanding and supportive. Yes, because I've, I've been at work and in the beginning, um, when I was back to work, people were very conscientious of me being in the room and then they start to forget and then somebody will make a comment and they'll look at me and they'll be like, oh my gosh, Michelle, I'm so sorry. And I'm just like, it's okay. You know, but I, I want them to be aware that, you know, you can't, like most people, if they're not affected by it, they just shoot those random comments out, not caring who, what target they're going to hit, knowing whether or not it's a, someone like me who's going to lose it because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I've heard people say mean things and it's a complete stranger and I'm like if that person turns around 
I don't know what I'm going to do right now. Or if they make a comment, like looking at me, like, see, you know what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the scenario that goes through my head, oh, I'm going to get arrested. because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do to this person. It's such a personal shot to the heart. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a very good way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah, I was at dinner with friends about six months ago, and I heard one of them say across the table that it's just the flu. And I looked right in his eyes, and I probably gave him a similar face that my mom used to give me when she was mad at me. <laughs> and I was like, it is not just a flu. I said, my mom had the flu many times. She lived every time. Right. Right. <sighs> yeah. Has anybody... I know I've already asked one of my last questions, but how do you, has anybody ever asked you or been insensitive about the pre-existing conditions question? Yes. Okay. Um, a, a friend of mine who I'm not terribly close with, we don't talk very often, but two, three days after he died said, just was not even a hello, how are you doing? It was, did he have any pre-existing conditions? And I was like, I'm going to unfriend you right now, take you off my thing. I, I didn't even respond to her. I was disgusted that she would just go straight for that. Yeah. And, and, and more people have asked, uh, but as time has gone on and as long as there's genuine sincerity in the, the way they address it, you know, uh, I, I will even answer it. Um, he didn't have any pre-existing conditions, but it just feels like they were looking to blame him for it. And that's what I get from it instantly. That's where my head goes. Mm -hmm. You're blaming it on him. And that's not fair. Yeah. 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 I have, I have two theories. One is, yeah, they're looking to blame the person who died and find out what was wrong with them. Right. The other thing I feel like is that people want to check off some boxes and go, oh, well, he had that. I don't. So I'm going to be okay. But there's no way to tell. That's the thing that that I don't understand is people with no pre-existing conditions or people that have so many, there's no way to tell whether COVID is going to take them, whether they're going to die or whether they're going to be completely asymptomatic and have nothing no symptoms at all. Right. And, you know, I, I knew of a person um, that had went into the hospital a few days before my husband did. I, I didn't know this person personally. I've just heard from it. He followed the same path my husband did. So he, he went on the vent and then he went on ECMO. And, and so, like I said, Thor went on it about three days after him. And yet my husband dies and he recovers and wakes up. Oh. And, it's like, I don't understand how that works either, but that's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Yeah. How have you coped with that? Um, you, you know, I, I don't, I don't really know. I just have to think that it was, it was his path. I, I'm not a religious person consider myself more agnostic um but i do find myself leaning a little bit toward god to make sense of it you know to know that um it just it was his path and i was lucky enough to have him for the eight and a half years that i did yeah Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much for having me and letting me talk. This is therapeutic in its own right, too. So I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, I think that's one thing I hear afterwards from people as I either get a text or an email that says it really helped, that they just feel better after sharing their loved one's story. And, you know, I think like this episode, when it comes out, there's going to be this story of you and Thor and your life and 
and you losing him and what happened that will be out there like in the world right yeah it's a beautiful thing thing. yes it is (laughs) yeah yeah thank you so much you're very welcome thank you Mm -hmm. And that's the show, everyone. If you've lost a loved one to COVID and would like to share your story on the show, please send me an email. My email address is for those we lost podcast at gmail.com. This show won't ever have a members area or episodes that you have to pay to listen to, but there are expenses to hosting a podcast. And if you'd like to help, you can support this show at buymeacoffee.com forward slash for those we lost. The link is in the show notes below. And if you're still listening, and thank you so much if you are, if you like this episode, please share it, share it with your friends, share it on your social media. And once you've done that, please rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts, because that's where most of our new listeners come from. Ratings and reviews are the main way this podcast finds new listeners. So please share the show. Until next time.